It's a bright autumn day in late 1916, and off the coast of the tiny island of Kia, Greece, a giant is dying. Britannic, one of the largest ships in the world, has been mortally wounded, and she is quickly sinking. 1916 is at the height of the First World War, and Britannic, a hospital ship, painted white with bold green stripes and red crosses to try to mark it out as an combatant is about to be cut down before its time and will become just another casualty of the war. Nervously, passengers and crew gather at the lifeboats to be lowered away to safety. They know all too well that dallying on a sinking ocean liner can mean death. The orders have come from the bridge to fill the boats, but not lower them into the ocean. There is confusion, concern. The ship's crew hold off for a while, but then Britannic begins to list heavily underfoot and there's no time to waste. The falls are released, and the boats lower away. They drop down bit by bit towards the perfect blue ocean until they hit the surface with a satisfying slap. The occupants begin to release the falls and set their boat free when there's a horrifying realization. The ship has sunk down enough that the massive propellers are now exposed, chopping the ocean into a seething white foam. Panicked, people jump overboard, but others are frozen in terror. Their wooden boat is pulled inexorably in. The rhythmic chopping of the blades is mesmerizing. Closer, closer, there can be no escape. Majesty's hospital ship, Britannic. She is the largest floating hospital in the world, with room for hundreds of patients and staffed by hundreds more doctors, surgeons and nurses. Britannic is a godsend for men who have been broken in one of the fiercest and bloodiest meat grinders of the First World War. Britannic's interiors are barren and spartan. There is no luxurious panelling or gilt fittings to be seen, but Britannic was not designed to be this way, quite the opposite. The ship was supposed to be the most luxurious liner in the world, a veritable floating hotel. How it all came to be is a fascinating tale, and it begins at dinner on a summer night way back in 1907. J. Bruce Ismay is the mustachioed president of the prestigious White Star Line, one of Britain's premier transatlantic shipping companies, and tonight he's meeting with an old friend. There at the dinner table is the director of the Harland & Wolf shipyard, William Peary. The two companies have a decades-old partnership, and together they have built some of the finest ships in history. The men, joined by their wives, have sat down for dinner at Peary's London estate, and the events that transpire that evening would prove to be pivotal in maritime history. From this meeting came the very first plans to design and construct a new trio of ocean liners that would take the transatlantic trade by storm. They were to be larger and more luxurious than the ships built by their old rivals, the Cunard Line, the popular Lusitania and Mauritania, which at the time were the two grandest ships afloat. The three White Star Wonder ships would tackle the Cunard liners head on and put the White Star line back on top. The first two liners would be built side by side at Harland and Wolf's yard in Belfast, and in 1911 the class leader, Olympic, was brought into service to great fanfare. She quickly became the most popular passenger vessel in the world, drawing in thousands of travellers who were eager to make their Atlantic crossing in world-class comfort. But quickly, it became clear to White Star officials that they had something special on their hands. Work on Titanic was coming along well, and she was on track to enter service alongside her sister ship in less than a year's time. But even as it seemed White Star was finally edging out the competition, there posed a new predicament. Cunard was hard at work on their brand new liner, Aquitania, built to serve alongside Mauritania and Lusitania in service, and Germany's Hamburg-America line was similarly rounding out a three-ship lineup of Imperator, 
Vaterland, and Bismarck. In Olympic and Titanic, White Star Line had opted to ignore setting speed records in favour of prioritising size and luxury, but now their rivals were playing by the same rules. Aquitania and the German ships were aimed specifically at topping Olympic and Titanic's luxury. It wasn't just size and luxury that were at play either. Cunard and Hamburg America both knew that to maximise profits and maintain as regular a service as possible, three similar or identical ships were needed. White Star Line knew it too. A mere two weeks after Olympic's maiden voyage, a third ship in the class was ordered, and in November 1911, her keel was laid where Olympic had once stood at the Harland and Wolfe slipway. Harland and Wolfe referred to their ships by hull numbers until the owners officially named them. In Olympic and Titanic's case, they were the numbers 400 and 401 respectively, but the third ship would be hull 433. Slowly, the hull began to take shape, as once again, for the third time, the workers at Harland and Wolfe undertook to build one of the world's biggest ships. Millions of steel and iron rivets would be driven into thick steel plating, many of them by hand. Tons and tons of specialist castings completed on site and by the Darlington Forge Company. The ship's backbone and ribs, they began to take shape. In the machine sheds, massive bed plates and engine assemblies began to gather. Propeller shafts, thicker than the trunks of ancient trees, span on giant industrial lathes. But it wasn't just the cold iron and steel that would form this great ship. The secret to her popularity with passengers would be in the hands of the decorators and artisans responsible for filling the cavernous interiors with comfortable and inviting furnishings. Olympic and Titanic had both introduced a new standard of luxury, but already lessons had been learned about what passengers wanted from their ships. Some spaces on Olympic proved more popular than others, and this new ocean liner would take these lessons and improve on them. Not only that, but Titanic, which had done the same thing, would prove more insight too as passengers dined in her sumptuous saloons and restaurants and lounged in the smoking rooms and cafes. In April 1912, 433's hull was still being assembled. Human hands busily drove red-hot rivets home, carved panels and hammered ornate chairs together. But then, tools were downed, and there came some shocking news. Titanic was lost. At the Harland and Wolf shipyard, the news hit like a lightning bolt. Shipbuilding was in Belfast's blood. The men and women of that noble, industrious city were justifiably and fiercely proud of their creations. It was ingrained in the city's culture. Towering over it were the enormous Aral gantries, huge steel structures created purely to build ships. Poet Louis McNeese began his poem, Carrick Fergus, with the line, I was born in Belfast, between the mountains and the gantries, to the hooting of lost sirens and the clang of trams. When news broke that Titanic had sunk on her maiden voyage, the centre of grief focused on the town of Southampton, England, where so many of the ship's crew had come from. But at Belfast, where the ship had been built and was expected to dock for regular servicing throughout her entire career, there was a dark pall of despair too. Ten members of the shipyard had joined Titanic for her first voyage, the so-called guarantee group, to ensure that all went well, but they were lost to a man. Chief among these was Thomas Andrews, Harland and Wolfe's managing director and Titanic's chief designer. Churches were packed with mourners, many remember seeing their fathers openly weeping for the first and only time. And there, sitting on the slipway unfinished, was the hull of the liner 433. While Olympic was withdrawn from service for retroactive upgrades that would prevent her from suffering Titanic's fate, Hull 433 was redesigned as it sat at the shipyard. With chief designer Thomas Andrews lost with Titanic, this only left his deputy, Edward Wilding, to assume his duties. Wilding, of course, was no stranger to the Olympic class. He had aided Andrews in Olympics and Titanic's designs. He had been called up to provide insight into the design during the inquiry into Titanic's loss. He'd be the one to oversee much of the required safety changes made to Olympic in the aftermath of Titanic's sinking, but Hull 433 presented a unique opportunity. 
It provided a blank slate for the design team because, being unfinished, massive changes could be made and built in from the ground up. Wilding and the team got to work, they would take the harsh lessons from Titanic's loss and re-establish Belfast as a world leader in ship construction. Under their watchful eye, they hoped that Hull 433 would be the safest ship yet built. First, they set about installing additional protection. An inner skin or double hull, this added layer of steel, ran up the inside of the ship and meant that anything piercing the outside shell would result in flooding the watertight, empty space in between. If Titanic had this innovation, she'd have survived her glancing blow with the iceberg. But as ever, in the world of naval architecture, this presented new and unique design challenges. 433's inner skin would eat up valuable interior space in the machinery compartments. It would mean the boilers, which sat in fives across the ship's width, couldn't all fit. So to solve this, the ship had to be widened from 92 feet 9 inches, or out 28 meters, to 94 feet, almost a full meter wider. But now, the design team was confronted with a different problem. Widening the ship threw out all their carefully calculated equations. It would have to maintain a speed in excess of 20 knots, any slower, and that reliable, regular service, its whole reason for being, would be impossible. But in widening the hull, the shape of the ship had changed, increasing drag, and the ship would simply be bigger since now that small change in width created a much larger amount of internal volume. The central turbine, the engine which turned the middle of the three propellers, was sized up to put out 18,000 horsepower instead of the original 16,000. The accidental result of this was that the turbine created by Harland and Wolf for Hull 433 would become, and still remains, the largest low-pressure exhaust turbine ever built for a liner. As 433's hull formed, Wilding and his team made other changes. Titanic's watertight bulkheads never reached any higher than D-Deck, which was a crucial contributor to her sinking. Many of 433's were raised as high as B-Deck, the very top of the ship's hull. This split the watertight compartments into groups that meant she could stay afloat with any six compartments flooded. By comparison, many cruise ships in operation today are designed to stay afloat with only two compartments open to the water. With the hull nearing completion, Holland and Wolf and the White Star Line were proud to finally reveal 433's name. Olympic had been named for the Olympians and Titanic for the Titans. Ancient mythological gods and giants to emphasize their size, but the third ship would break from this pattern. Instead of taking inspiration from fables, she would be named for something real life, but equally as monumental and terrifying in its power. The British Empire itself, 433, would be named Britannic. In February 1914, Britannic finally made her way down the slipway without a christening, as was tradition for Holland and Wolf ships. Thousands cheered as she glided effortlessly into the water. Her size and splendour were testament to the promising career that was to come, and the workers of Belfast were immensely proud of their creation. Moored at the fitting out wharf, Britannic was to sit for months while the empty shell was turned into a functional ship. A giant floating crane loaded in tons and tons of equipment. Heavy engine bed plates, monumental castings, the boilers, massive pieces of machinery that would drive the ship through the ocean. But it wasn't just cold machinery being put into place though, now it was up to Harland and Wolf's master artisans to swarm aboard like an army of worker ants and fit out the ship's spectacular interiors. Olympic and Titanic had set a high standard, but Britannic would far surpass it. The first class grand staircase was totally redesigned. This had been the crown jewel of her sister's interior design, but on Britannic, it would be far more ornate, with a unique feature, a towering pipe organ which could play for passengers. This strange addition would give Britannic a totally different feel from that of her surviving sister Olympic. In other places, more changes were made. The austere swimming pool found on Olympic was overhauled for Britannic. The bare steel was instead clad with ornate panels, likely marble, and the structural columns were disguised too. Edwardian tastes were changing all the time, and a higher standard was expected. In earlier liners, passengers in first class still made use of communal bathrooms, but on Britannic nearly every first class stateroom would feature an ensuite. Luxury cabins and suites were upgraded, 
and made more sumptuous. Female passengers got a hair salon and children got a playroom. The ship would be a kind of super Olympic, improving on the older vessel in almost every way. Gradually, Britannic began to take shape, but soon, as the months sped by, world events overtook her, and nothing would be the same. War. It erupted after years of tension and spread, first through the Balkans, and then to Central Europe. France, Germany, Britain, they were all drawn into a deadly, horrendous struggle that transformed Flanders' green fields into a muddy hell. Within weeks, hundreds, and then thousands were dying every day. At sea, the passenger trade slowed to a halt, and most vessels were mothballed, their services suspended. Those that weren't laid up were repurposed for use in the war effort as either armed merchant cruisers or as troop ships. The original idea had been that liners could sport guns and serve as auxiliary warships, but it soon became obvious that these lumbering giants were too large and soft a target for this kind of work. The Admiralty paid the shipping companies for the use of their vessels, but the owners were still badly at risk, since now their costly fleets were being converted into justified targets of war. For the Admiralty, large liners proved to be difficult to maneuver in narrow channels, and to top it off, they were extremely costly to run, staff, and maintain. Crucially, the great liners burned tons and tons of coal. Ships like Mauritania burned a thousand tons per day at full speed. Coal, the Admiralty thought, would be better employed in battleships and cruisers. In the midst of all this chaos, Britannic remained laid up, half finished with Mauritania, Aquitania, and Olympic, all facing similar uncertainty. With the world's greatest ships sitting idle, nobody could have envisaged that the scale and bloody carnage of the war was soon to create a whole new purpose for them, and the genesis of this repurposing sparked all the way over in a peninsula of Turkey, known as Gallipoli. In February 1915, an offensive was launched in the Mediterranean. The Commonwealth forces would attempt to capture Constantinople and seize the Dardanelles Straits. If successful, this would allow Allied shipping to pass through the Straits to the Black Sea, where they could rendezvous with their Russian allies to plot an offensive on Turkey, and ultimately push them out of the war. Not only that, but a successful invasion would open a second front on Germany at a time when the Western Front had ground to a bloody stalemate. The key commodity for the success of this campaign was men, hundreds of thousands of them, and they would all need to be transported there by ship. The Admiralty looked toward the great luxury liners that sat quietly at anchor, and they could no longer deny the usefulness of ships of this size. One by one, beginning with Mauritania, passenger vessels began to be requisitioned by the Admiralty as troop transports. The great liners were going to war. British, Australian, and New Zealand troops set off boldly for the Dardanelles, excited by the prospect of ending the war within the year. They expected to face an ill-prepared enemy because Turkey, then known as the sick old man of Europe, was in a state of political and social collapse. They expected to storm the beachhead, capture key high points and move inland, an unstoppable sea of men in khaki. So you can only imagine their horror when, as they landed on the beaches, they were met with a storm of lead. Machine gun bullets, artillery, an incessant hail of death that didn't stop for months. The Gallipoli force never made it more than two and a half miles or four kilometers inland before they were stopped by a disciplined, well-led, and fiercely proud Turkish defensive force. The campaign was a terrible, terrible failure, and it was paid for in blood. Thousands of men were killed and wounded, suffering through horrendous conditions, pelting rain and freezing cold during the winter, but then blazing sun in the summer. By September 1915, the Admiralty didn't need to bring more men in, they needed to evacuate them out, bloodied and broken. Aquitania and Mauritania were each converted from troop transports to hospital ships, leaving a need for a vessel that could replace one of them as a trooper. Olympic was called up quickly to fill this void, and this left Britannic, half completed and still awaiting orders at Belfast. 
Harland and Wolfe had continued on outfitting Britannic as normal, undeterred from their mission to deliver a luxury passenger liner, but a flurry of orders for warships from the yard had delayed her construction considerably. Nearly 3,000 miles away at Gallipoli, diseases like typhus and dysentery began to spread among the troops to numbers far exceeding that of casualties from battle wounds. The Admiralty recognised that the two Cunard hospital ships just weren't enough, with medical evacuations soaring to up to 2,000 men per week, more than half a division every month. The time had finally come. Britannic was called up for duty. Many of Britannic's luxurious interior fixtures and furnishings had already been installed before work was halted, and now that she was called up for service, the interiors would need to be stripped bare to make room for austere medical facilities and accommodations for the wounded. What were intended to be first-class public spaces instead became patient wards. Her reception room was converted into a full-scale surgical theatre, and the spacious first-class dining room was transformed into an intensive care unit. Her exteriors received a wartime makeover too. Her trademark white star colours were painted over with those of a hospital ship. A clean, white coat of paint decorated with three red crosses on each side of the ship, connected by a green band that wrapped its way around the hull. Her funnels lost their signature white star buff, and instead were painted over with a vibrant yellow. Her builders went to great lengths to make sure that Britannic wouldn't be targeted by the enemy. Four massive red crosses could be lit up at night with 125 electric bulbs, and strung from the promenade deck were hundreds of green lamps. Sailing fully lit up at night, there could be no denying Britannic status as a hospital ship. This livery would provide Britannic with immunity from attack as she transported the wounded. The Hague Convention of 1907 made this abundantly clear. Hospital ships not being used in any apparent military capacity were not to be fired upon because they existed solely to bring aid to the wounded. Britannic was no ordinary hospital ship either. She was, at the time, the largest British ship ever built. Not only was she hard to miss steaming over open waters, but in an era where Germany exercised unrestricted submarine warfare and U-boat captains raced to rack up the biggest tally of enemy tonnage sunk, Britannic's immense size made her a tempting target for adversaries, hospital ship or not. The conversion to hospital ship was so sudden, so abrupt, that some of the safety features intended for Britannic were never fitted. Britannic's exterior looked similar to Olympics except for one glaring difference. Towering over the ship's decks were enormous lifeboat cranes, a new kind of safety feature called the gantry davit. These giants were powered by electric motors. The design of the davits meant that even if the ship was leaning hard over in the water, the lifeboats could be safely plucked from the deck and lowered against the list of the ship. In all ships with smaller davits, a list beyond 15 or 20 degrees would mean all boats on one side of the ship would be useless. Most impressively, these new davits were capable of reaching lifeboats all the way on the other side of the ship. It looked good on paper, but there was a critical oversight. Several of the davits were installed directly in line with the funnels, which blocked them. Despite this, the gantry davit was a huge leap forward for Britannic safety measures. They spoiled her silhouette a little bit, but in an age where lowering lifeboats was a complicated manual affair that could just as easily result in the boat overturning or falling, the electric gantry davits were like a space-age jump into the future. But as the time for Britannic's introduction loomed large, Harland and Wolfe realised they'd run out of time. Only five of the eight sets of gantry davits that were planned to be installed actually made it onto the ship. To make up for it, the shipbuilders installed rows of more traditional Welland-type davits that Olympic and Titanic had used. All told, Britannic's total lifeboat capacity jumped to 3,600 people with these changes in place, that's 300 more than her maximum onboard capacity, and 2,400 more people than could fit on the lifeboats found aboard Titanic. She'd been designed to service the rich and the famous, hopeful migrants and excited travellers, but now she would serve as a floating hospital for the Commonwealth's shattered soldiers. The Royal Mail ship had been transformed to become His Majesty's hospital ship, Britannic. By December 1915, the ship was finally ready for service. 
She would not be seen off from Southampton by a cheering crowd of enthusiastic spectators. Her role as a hospital ship made her maiden voyage a quieter affair. There were no orchestras playing dockside, no celebrations and waving handkerchiefs. The crew and nurses simply boarded the ship with all of their belongings and took their posts. Despite the fact that she would never be met with the same fanfare as her sisters, the ship's surgeon, Dr. John Beaumont, still remarked that Britannic was the most wonderful hospital ship that ever sailed the seas. Commanding the ship was Captain Charles Alfred Bartlett, known as Iceberg Charlie by his crew due to his rumoured ability to smell ice, a neat parlour trick that, if true, might have been able to help Titanic out of a tight spot. Also known as Holystone Charlie because of his fondness for a nice, clean deck, Bartlett had a long history as a White Star Line captain, and he knew his business well. Over two decades spent at the helm of White Star vessels had earned him the coveted spot as the master of their largest ship at sea. Not only had he served as ship's captain for many years, but he also spent time as White Star Line's marine superintendent. This had given him intimate knowledge of the vessels he was to oversee, since he had been part of the discussions regarding Olympic and Britannic's design changes while they were still at Belfast. On December 14th, 1915, Captain Bartlett took command of Britannic, the ultimate master of the ship, and its complement of 100 nurses, 388 non-commissioned and commissioned officers, and 675 crew members. Two days before Christmas, Britannic set off for the first time, and her destination was known only to a privileged few. Aboard the ship for this strange maiden voyage was a mixture of curious characters, chief among which was Violet Jessop. She'd worked as a stewardess aboard Titanic and survived the sinking, but now three years later she found herself working as a nurse on board Britannic. As the ship steamed away from Liverpool, Violet was looking forward to visiting her sick brother in Malta, because that's where she'd been assured that they were headed. Others on board were certain the ship was heading for Australia, but it soon became clear that her destination was actually Mudros, a town on the island of Lemnos in Greece. Mudros served as an Allied base during the Gallipoli campaign, and was now where thousands of sick and wounded Allied soldiers waited for safe passage home. Britannic made headway, and for the first time on a proper voyage, her engines were run up to full steam. This maiden voyage was an uneventful one, but the nurses and staff aboard the massive ship must have occupied themselves with finding their way around the labyrinthine interiors. Britannic's chaplain, Reverend John Fleming, later wrote that she was a perfect beauty. Freshly painted from end to end, the graceful band of green relieving the monotony of white, and the great red crosses standing out vividly against their background. The heavy Atlantic chop made shipboard duties more challenging than usual, but despite the weather, the ship's nurses set about readying 3,300 beds for the patients awaiting them in the Mediterranean. In order to assure a non-stop trip home to Southampton, the ship made a stop in Naples to fill up with coal and water before moving on to their destination. Under the looming shadow of Mount Vesuvius, Britannic looked a gorgeous sight. Reverend Fleming remembered that, one night, when looking down from the mountainside upon one of the loveliest bays in Europe, catching sight of the Britannic lying at anchor, it seemed like a picture from fairyland, and the green lights and the giant red crosses stood out in bold relief against the dark background of the sea. Finally, Britannic reached Mudros and she received her first round of patients transferred off of smaller hospital ships. Most of these men had never been lucky enough to experience life on board a liner the size of Britannic, so their first encounter with the vessel was something to remember. Private R. E. Atkinson had been transferred onto Britannic after being evacuated from Gallipoli, and he was immediately taken with the sheer size and grandeur of the ship. He noted that even though he boarded Britannic from the smaller hospital ship's well deck, he needed to ascend five flights of stairs before reaching Britannic's boat deck. He remarked the ship's swimming pool, lifts and telephones made it feel more like a floating town than a hospital ship. But despite her size, the Britannic was a utilitarian workhorse, far from the glorious luxury liner that she was originally supposed to be. Private Atkinson was quickly disillusioned. He wrote, Grub is rotten. Starvation, two slices for breakfast. Dinner, stew in a basin. Thought it was soup first course, but nothing else came. 
patients get nearly frozen waiting to get up from trawlers. Some stretcher cases get doused with water from the ship's side. Cocoa and hard biscuits for supper, church in the evening with gilt edge prayer books marked WSL. Britannic steamed on, lights blaring, unescorted. To help prevent misidentification as a warship, walking wounded were only allowed on deck in blue hospital clothing. Despite all the pains taken to mark the ship out as an aid vessel, the crossings were not relaxed. Disaster could come at any second. Every day, stories came through of ships being torpedoed or mined. Lusitania had been attacked and sunk only months earlier. A Red Cross volunteer, Vera Britton, recalled the tense feelings. She said, I remember the feelings of terror the dark hours used to bring us on the Britannic. Feelings which, of course, we never mentioned to each other at the time, but afterwards all admitted we had. I used to look over the steep side of that tremendous ship and think to myself, perhaps now, or now. It's being on the qui vive, or lookout, for something that may happen at any moment of any hour, which makes the strain of a long voyage nowadays. I used to wake up at night and listen to the thresh of the screws and the whistle of the wind above the mastheads and the rushing of the water against the ship and wonder if any among the strange occasional crashes and bangs that went on all night was a torpedo or mine striking the ship. Britannic operated well as a hospital ship carrying evacuated patients home from Madras, Naples and Augusta much of this time was spent aiding the casualties of the miscalculated Gallipoli campaign. After a third voyage in April 1916, where she received the transfer of patients from the smaller hospital ships in Augusta, once again Britannic would see herself at another crossroads. Britannic had been put in service as hospital ship in response to the rising casualties from Gallipoli, but now the campaign was well and truly over and done with. The transport division was increasingly mindful of the costs of running, maintaining and staffing these massive vessels. Each trip home to Southampton saw Britannic bringing back fewer and fewer patients, so by early summer it was decided that Britannic would be released from her wartime service and handed back over to White Star Line to be finally transformed into the world's grandest luxury liner. The Admiralty paid White Star £75,000, or about two million US dollars in today's money, to complete the conversion. Britannic arrived in Belfast in June 1916. It was a strange homecoming. The ship had proved herself as capable and reliable, and maybe someday soon she'd have the glamorous maiden transatlantic crossing she deserved. The hospital wards were emptied, the officers' messes gutted to be transformed into luxurious staterooms, the carvers and artisans streamed aboard once again. For two months they toiled to turn the ship into a luxurious passenger liner and it seemed like Britannic would survive the war intact. But then, there came a message from the Admiralty that changed everything. Even though the Gallipoli campaign had reached its end, the war raged on elsewhere. When Britannic had been returning to Belfast for restoration, preparations were being made for a great British and French offensive on the Western Front. As always, the plans had been grand, but the execution was lacking. It was a horror day for the Allied powers. The British suffered over 57,000 casualties with nearly 20,000 dead on the first day of the attack alone. As the weeks passed, the bodies piled up. In four months, over 400,000 men would become casualties. Elsewhere in the Balkans, malaria was spreading like wildfire amongst the men. There had been so many losses that troops were urgently needed from far away. Olympic and Mauritania served as troop transports almost purely to ship in Commonwealth men from Canada. With only one hospital ship serving in the Mediterranean, and casualties once again beginning to mount thanks to the Balkan and North African fronts, there was only one sound solution to the problem. Just three months after having been released from wartime service, Britannic was recalled back to duty. The work to convert her into a passenger ship was again stopped and reversed. Whatever luxurious fittings had been installed were taken out, the pipe organ was crated up, and the hospital wards and operating theatres were reinstalled. There was a morbid reminder of the realities of Britannic's duties. A morgue had been constructed at the very stern of the ship, well away from the other patient's gaze. Captain Bartlett once again took command, 
and the ship and her crew steamed away from Southampton, this would be one of the last times the ship would see her home port. On October 28, 1916, Britannic was again at Madras in Greece. Smaller ships joined alongside and transferring patients to be repatriated back to Southampton. It was almost as though her service had never been suspended. Patients boarded the ship, rolled onto the gangway on stretchers and were tended to by the nursing staff on the voyage home. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, Britannic was doing her duty well, but unbeknownst to the crew and passengers a deadly chain of events were playing out which would spell disaster. At the same time Britannic's crew were focused on boarding the sick and the injured, the German submarine U-73 was hard at work in the Kia Channel off Greece, not simply patrolling, but laying mines. In an attempt to obstruct Allied shipping heading through the channel, submarine commander Gustav Sees gave the order to lay a barrage of mines off the island of Kia. Sees understood well the number of Allied ships moving through the area, and he also knew that mines would not discriminate between battleships and hospital ships. What concerned Sees the most was tonnage. After laying the mines, the U-boat remained in the area for six hours, waiting to see if their work would net a target. There would be no target sunk that day, so Cease and his crew moved on, confident that given enough time, their mines would do the job. All they needed to do now was wait. Britannic soldiered on, departing from Southampton once again, destined for another stop off at Naples for her usual refill of coal and water. In fact, the stay at Naples was delayed thanks to a nasty storm which had blown into the area. It was so bad that Britannic, lying idle in the harbour, was likely to be blown ashore. She dropped all three of her massive bow anchors to keep her in place and ride it out. On Sunday, November 19th, Bartlett found a lull in the weather and the huge ship steamed out of the harbour but that evening the weather picked up again and Britannic battled her way south through the Bay of Naples. It had been a dramatic departure, but the next morning the weather had cleared just in time for the ship to steam through the gorgeous Straits of Messina, a sight which always drew the nurses up to the deck to watch. That night, as the sun dropped below the horizon and bathed the ship in an evening glow, all was calm. Britannic had 1,065 aboard, all of them staff and crew because she hadn't picked any patients up yet. Nobody could know that this would be Britannic's final evening, and as she left the sleeping sun behind her, the ship steamed off into the night. She was heading to round the southernmost tip of Greece and swing northeast for the Aegean Sea. But directly ahead lay the Kia Channel. Britannic made full steam and sped off into history. The morning on November 21st, 1916. All was well. Breakfast was being served, and the crew was preparing for the day. A church service was concluding on board, observing the presentation of Mary. Chatter could be heard throughout the decks as nurses and officers completed final preparations for the boarding of patients planned for later that afternoon. To make things as comfortable for the patients as possible, the ship's big portholes were unlocked and swung open. This contravened orders, but it meant that the hot Mediterranean sun wouldn't heat the ship's steel interior into a muggy hell, and the air would be fresh and clear. Elsewhere, a number of Boy Scouts had joined the ship's crew for the voyage, eager to observe and learn shipboard duties, such as operating lifts, running boat drills and learning Morse code, and on this morning, just as any other, they'd set about their duties under the tutelage of the ship's crew. Britannic was making full speed as she entered the Kia Channel, and Bartlett kept a watchful eye on the bridge. Britannic's propellers churned the clear blue waters into boiling white foam. It was a fine, clear day. But below the surface, just ahead, lay a deadly surprise. For days now, this E-mine had floated, its mooring chains gently jingling as it bobbed in the currents. Undisturbed, it was harmless. But within its casing was packed a 290-pound, 130-kilogram, wet gun cotton charge. Contact with the steel hull of a ship would set it off. There was no warning sign it was there. Below the ocean's waves, it was invisible. And as it sat there, the chains gently jingling, there was a growing roar. A massive ship was bearing down on it. 
just a few feet to the left or right, and the mine would be left behind undisturbed. But as fate would have it, this ship was steaming right on course. And through the dim, blue light, the stem of the ship appeared. Then it came closer and closer until finally, contact was made and the mine detonated. Just after 8 in the morning, a deafening roar was heard throughout the ship, bringing the quiet morning's routine to a screeching halt. One of U-73's mines had found their target, and Britannic gave a violent shudder as 290 pounds of explosive detonated against its hull, and within minutes, doctors and nurses alike sprung into action. Violet Jessup had been busying herself with preparing breakfast for a sick nurse, and she recalled that as one man, the whole saloon rose from their seats. Doctors and nurses vanished to their posts in a trice. The pantry where I stood, holding a teapot in one hand and a pan of butter in the other, was cleared too as men dropped what they were doing and jumped over presses with the agility of deer. In seconds, not a soul was to be seen, and not a sound had been uttered. Many of the nurses and staff, like Vera Britton, had been anticipating an attack like this for months. The quiet, surreal calm and safety aboard Britannic had seemed too good to be true and now their worst fears had become reality. But this was a blessing in disguise. She, along with many others on board, had been expecting this exact scenario and immediately, instinctively knew what had happened. This came in sharp contrast to Violet Jessup's experience immediately after Titanic's collision with an iceberg when passengers assumed the ship had only thrown a propeller blade and many had to be convinced to proceed to the lifeboats. But not everybody immediately managed to grasp the gravity of the situation. 15-year-old scout George Perman had been operating one of the ship's aft lifts. He didn't hear any explosion at all, but he quickly realised something was wrong when he felt shockwaves rippling through the ship's hull. Hundreds of feet away at Britannic's bow, things looked much different. 5th Officer Gordon Fielding had been thrown across his cabin, his possessions and gear raining down from cabinets, shelves and tables. Immediately, he knew that this was no simple collision, because the explosion from deep down within the ship's bowels had sent dust and fumes surging up through ventilator shafts, blinding him temporarily. Down in the belly of the ship, stokers working at the boilers had been stunned by the sudden, violent explosion followed by a tsunami of water as it roared into the gaping moor left behind. Stoker Bert Smith was swept from the forward fireman's tunnel and pinned against the boilers by a deluge of water. Desperately, he grabbed for the handrail of a walkway and was able to just make his way to the emergency staircase nearby. On the bridge, Captain Bartlett and Chief Officer Robert Hume worked quickly to assess the damage. Immediately, the captain ordered the engines stopped and the watertight doors closed while he waited to learn exactly what had happened. But before long, reports began to come in and the extent of the damage became known. The explosion occurred on the starboard, right-hand side of the ship between two of the cargo holds. This by itself would have been well within Britannic's ability to weather damage, but the damage had spread further due to the force of the explosion, and the watertight bulkheads between one of the holds and the four-peak tank had also suffered damage. The ship's first four watertight compartments were beginning to flood, but because of the changes made to her design after Titanic sinking, she would be able to stay afloat with six compartments open to the ocean. But unfortunately though, this was still not the extent of the damage. The fireman's tunnel between the fireman's quarters in the bow and the boiler room number six had been damaged in the blast, and this also meant that the watertight door in that area was unable to close. And then, as if to add insult to injury, another watertight door, crucially located between two of the compartments, had failed to close. The shock of the explosion had likely bent and shifted the rails that the door ran down, stopping it from shutting. Ominously, Britannic began to take on a list to starboard, and even with all of this extensive damage, with the tons of water roaring in, the jammed watertight doors, Britannic still theoretically should have been able to stay afloat, but there was one final element at play. The ship's portholes had been opened to air out the hospital wards, but this well-meaning gesture would doom the entire ship. As her bow dropped and the portholes came into contact with the ocean, tons of water began to roar into the ship's interiors and flood aft, 
over the tops of the watertight compartments. As much water could roar in through just four open portholes as could have flooded into the holes that the iceberg made in the Titanic. All of this taken together meant that Britannic had met her limit of six compartments flooded, and she was now on borrowed time. It was up to Captain Bartlett to decide what to do with his severely damaged vessel. Britannic was in a terrible state, and even though she was designed to withstand far more than her sister Titanic, she was now just as close to sinking only 10 minutes after the blast as Titanic had been a full hour after her collision with the iceberg. Bartlett knew he did not have the luxury of time to weigh his options. He made a quick plan to attempt to save his vessel. If he could beach the ship on soft sand, then she couldn't sink. He ordered Britannic to make for the nearby island of Kia, just three miles or five kilometers away. But then there came more bad news. The rudder's steering gear had failed. They'd have to steer with the propellers. With only the port propeller churning ahead, the ship would slowly turn to the right. In the meantime, Bartlett realized that despite their close proximity to the island, beaching Britannic at Kia was still not a sure shot. He ordered a distress signal be sent out and lifeboats be made ready. The SOS was received by two ships, HMS Scourge and HMS Heroic, but Britannic never received a response. Nobody on board could know that the ship's antenna wires had snapped due to the force of the explosion, and while she could still send transmissions, she was unable to receive them. Nurse Violet Jessup, having survived both Olympic's collision with the British cruiser Hawke in 1911 and Titanic sinking only seven months later, was no stranger to crisis on board ship. She quickly made her way down to the cabin of the sick nurse that she'd been looking after and helped her to collect her things and get into a life jacket. Jessup herself clumsily slipped her life belt on over her coat and ensured she had her toothbrush with her because she remembered how desperately she had wished she had one after being rescued on board Carpathia after Titanic sank. She tucked the toothbrush along with a few small items into the pocket of her apron and, never one to panic, the plucky nurse calmly made her way up toward the boat deck. Up on deck, lifeboats were being prepared to be boarded, but as officers began to swing out the boats from the gantry davits, some of the passengers began to panic. They tried to storm the boats, but they were forced back, the officers pushing for order. There was already some confusion regarding procedure now, though, because Bartlett had only given orders to ready and load the lifeboats, but not to launch them. He was still hopeful that his attempt to beach the vessel would be successful, as the ship limped her way, smouldering and listing, towards the island of Kia. Meanwhile, officers were unsure of what to do once the lifeboats began to be boarded. The list became more and more severe, and the situation was becoming more precarious by the minute. With Britannic still moving slowly forward, it was too dangerous to attempt to lower the boats, but with several lifeboats already boarded and hanging over the side of the ship, with no further orders issued, officers began to take measures into their own hands. Two boats were lowered into the water, including one that had been boarded by Violet Jessup. The boat dropped slowly and smoothly over the ship's side, the electric motors of the gantry davits doing their job well. The lifeboat slapped down into the water, the falls were released, but then, one after another, the boat's occupants began to dive into the ocean. Very quickly, only Jessup and one other doctor were left alone in the boat. It was a strange sight, but then she turned around and quickly realized why. Britannic's bow had dropped, and now the ship's massive bronze propellers, likely the largest ever affixed to an ocean liner, were still spinning wildly above the surface of the water, and lifeboats and swimmers alike were being pulled in toward the spinning blades. Another lifeboat had fallen victim to the propellers already, smashed to pieces and its passengers torn apart. Frozen with terror, Jessup had a sudden realization. Despite her many years serving aboard ships, she had never learned to swim. But in this moment, looking on with horror as her boat bore down on the massive bronze blades, she had no choice. Jessup jumped out of the lifeboat and into the blood-streaked sea amidst the chaos of terrified survivors, debris and bodies. She experienced for the first time in her life what it felt like to be completely submerged in water. She rocketed up 
then hit her head on the underside of the lifeboat that she'd just jumped from hard enough to fracture her skull. But finally, she broke free and found the surface, kicking and paddling with all her might away from the gruesome scene. She cleared the propeller blades by mere feet, but now she found herself surrounded by a scene of violent carnage, panic and death far more gruesome, she later stated, than anything she had experienced on the night of the Titanic's sinking. George Perman, the 15-year-old Boy Scout who'd been operating the ship's aft lift at the time of the explosion, had made it onto the same lifeboat as Violet Jessup, but in his attempt to retreat from the imminent danger of the blades, he'd grabbed hold of one of the ropes affixed to the boat from the davit above. Hanging desperately from the rope, swinging wildly above the water, George watched, terrified as a scene far too gruesome for his young years played out before his very eyes. The ship's white hull was streaked with blood, and the water below were speckled with bodies. The panic cries of those treading water would haunt him for years as he watched people desperately attempt to swim free of the thrashing propeller blades. He slowly lowered himself into the water and swam clear. Two lifeboat loads full of people had been effectively sent to their deaths as the engines kept steaming the ship towards Kia. But Captain Bartlett, having never issued the order to lower any boats to begin with, had no idea of the carnage that was happening at the after end of his ship. At 8.35am, only 23 minutes after the explosion, Bartlett finally ordered the engines stopped just before a third lifeboat would have been sent to its fate. This allowed the evacuation to finally proceed properly and it gave the nurses in lifeboats enough time to tend to the wounded who were still treading water, using ripped pieces of aprons as bandages and tourniquets. On board the heavily damaged but now stationary Britannic, lifeboats were finally being safely launched into the water. By 8.50, 35 lifeboats had been successfully lowered into the sea. But Bartlett still felt there may be a chance to save his ship. He ordered the boats be held from lowering, and ordered the engines once again restarted. Kia was just within reach, and if there was even a small chance of beaching his ship, he wanted to take it. But sadly, it was too late. As Britannic moved slowly ahead, water only roared in faster, and ten minutes later, reports came in that the ship was flooded all the way up to D-deck. He knew the situation was now hopeless. Bartlett ordered the engines stopped for the final time, and used the ship's steam for one final gesture. He blasted the ship's whistles. It was as if the ship was playing her own funeral dirge. The mournful call was unmistakable. Britannic was dying. Bartlett stood on the bridge wing, accompanied by Assistant Commander Harry Dyke and Chief Engineer Robert Fleming. Water roared over the forecastle that once proudly soared above the ocean's waves. Britannic groaned as her steel bent and flexed, but all aboard was calm. All the lifeboats were away, the passengers safely bobbing on the sea's calm surface. Bartlett must have gazed up at the enormous funnels of the ship that towered over him, wistfully, one last time. He turned to the officers next to him, the last men aboard, and then the three walked to the edge of the deck. One at a time they stepped into the water, because now the bow of the ship had submerged to the level of the bridge, and as was tradition, Captain Bartlett was the last to leave Britannic. He swam to a nearby collapsible lifeboat and watched on as the great ship disappeared. Hundreds of eyes were glued to the remarkable sight. It was the death of a titan.
Titanic was taking her final gasping breaths. A funnel gave way shortly after Bartlett had abandoned ship and within minutes, the other funnels followed suit. By this point, Britannic had rolled completely onto her starboard side and the stern continued to rise into the air, but as the ship foundered, the bow collided with the shallow seabed below with a deep groan. Violet Jessup had been pulled from the water and into a motor launch, and she watched as the ship began to slip beneath the surface. She recalled Britannic's pathetic last moments with vivid detail, stating, She dipped her head a little, then a little lower and still lower. All the deck machinery fell into the sea like a child's toys. Then she took a fearful plunge, her stern rearing hundreds of feet into the air, until, with a final roar, she disappeared into the depths the noise of her going resounding through the water with undreamt of violence. At 9.07am, less than one hour after a fateful encounter with the mine laid by U-73, Britannic, the last of the great four-stacker transatlantic liners and the darling of the White Star Line, was gone. With the great ship lost, survivors in lifeboats scrambled to tend to the wounded and do what they could to help with the rowing, despite many of them having no training as sailors. Those still in the water were kept afloat by deck chairs and life rafts, awaiting rescue. The ship's motor launches, being much faster and easier to operate than the traditional lifeboats, got to work, motoring back and forth and pulling survivors out of the water. Britannic had called for help via Morse code and received no response, but in a stroke of dumb luck, the warship HMS Heroic had just passed by Britannic en route to Piraeus only one hour before, and she was able to return to their exact position and aid survivors very quickly. HMS Scourge received the signal too and rushed to the scene. Joined by small local fishing boats, they worked together over the course of the next hour and a half to bring survivors on board and see to their care. The motor launchers were able to ferry survivors back to shore on nearby Carissia, where the locals were deeply sympathetic to their suffering taking them into their homes, washing their clothes, and offering them food. Not everyone who made it to shore survived, and Sergeant William Sharp succumbed to his injuries, despite Violet Jessup's best efforts to save him. HMS Foxhound arrived at 11.45 to take on a total of 193 survivors from the small island, and later joined Heroic and Scourge, both full to the brim with survivors, on their way to Piraeus. That afternoon, at 3.45, the ships reached Piraeus, but the question quickly turned to that of accommodation for the survivors. They were split into groups and sent to stay at local hotels to gather their thoughts and come to terms with the scale of events that they had just lived through. As they did so, when the White Star Line was cabled the terrible news that their finest ship had been lost, questions began to be asked about what had happened. An investigation into the sinking was held on board HMS Duncan, with Captain Hugh Hurd, commanding officer, and Captain George Steyer, chief engineer, working alongside Britannic's Captain Bartlett to review the evidence, hoping to build a case which pointed to a German war crime. There were still questions surrounding whether the ship had been struck by a mine or a torpedo launched from a German U-boat. While the investigations held after Titanic's sinking spanned many months, and generated untold pages of testimony and reports, after roughly a week of investigation, the resulting 700-word report on Britannic sinking was brief and to the point. The conclusion of the report read, the effects of the explosion might have been due to either a mine or a torpedo, the probability seems to be a mine. Despite this, after the release of the report, the press was quick to colour their own reports with anti-German sentiment pointing to Germany's supposed disregard for the laws of nations. The Daily Mirror erroneously reported that the crew and medical staff had worked tirelessly to rescue 1,000 sick and injured patients during the sinking, despite the fact the Britannic sank with no patients on board. In the end, Britannic became the largest ship lost during World War I and the largest passenger ship to ever sink at sea. All told, while the sinking of Britannic was in some ways more bloody than that of her sister ship Titanic, the death toll was far lower. Only 30 people perished when Britannic sank, mostly due to the premature lifeboat launching which sent them helplessly into the ship's swirling propellers. This terrible tragedy aside, 
The evacuation had been mostly orderly and well executed. The quick thinking of the medical staff and crew, together with increased lifeboat capacity and greater efficiency in loading them, plus the ship's close proximity to land and a high volume of shipping traffic in the area, it all meant that Britannic was spared the bulk of the tragic fate that befell her older sister, Titanic. Despite the sudden chaos of the sinking, the survivors of Britannic were much better off than those who'd been on Titanic. The enhanced safety features had worked well. Britannic's large complement of lifeboats and more efficient gantry davits meant that most passengers were able to secure a place on a boat and they were then lowered away quickly. Titanic's victims, though, had found themselves plunged into a frigid North Atlantic Ocean whose temperature killed in only 15 minutes. But by contrast, the Aegean Sea was warm, almost pleasant. Perhaps most fortunately though, Britannic hadn't taken on the scores of wounded men she was meant to. Her complement of crew and staff were trained military and medical personnel whose various backgrounds had prepared them for this exact moment. The evacuation had been orderly and quick, and injuries could be tended to by the ship's many nurses. But despite the fact some 30 lives had been lost, there was a creeping, inevitable realisation that many must have had. If Britannic had been loaded with hundreds or thousands of wounded soldiers, the numbers of lives lost would likely have been unthinkable. Britannic would not live to see her glory days, transporting starry-eyed passengers across the vast Atlantic. No musicians saw her off on her maiden voyage. No musicians took to her decks to play for fearful passengers as she founded. Britannic's story was a far cry from the pomp and tragedy of Titanic, but hers was still a proud, dignified career. Even after the ship found her final resting place beneath the sea, the doctors, Nurses and orderlies assigned to Britannic continued in their duties to treat and nurse the wounded back to health, even when the patients weren't soldiers, but their own shipmates. The courage and wisdom shown in Britannic's final hour were a testament to the skill and passion of those on board. Despite her loss once again casting a shadow over the White Star Line's legacy, Britannic would go on to be remembered as one of the finest ships ever put to sea. Today, Britannic rests about three nautical miles northwest of Carissia, Greece, only 400 feet beneath the surface of the waves. Lying now on her starboard side, hiding the damage inflicted by the mine, she is surprisingly intact. Some have even thought about raising her, but to this day, the vast hulk of this decaying ship stands as a monument, not just to the 30 lives lost during her sinking, but to the thousands of lives saved by history's greatest hospital ship. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.